kind of messing with these things ever since. And uh, when I chop on this, things are going to fly this way and that way. So I suggest everybody gets up that way. They will fly 40 feet sometimes. So I want to just warn you that these uh, do fly out. It helps a lot to have a nice anvil underneath to help absorb the shock and uh, let everything soak in. So we need you up this way or that way. There you go. This is an archaic axe. The first axes in Illinois, they had a groove that went all the way around them, and they were last something like this. But they would get loose. And what happened is when you chop for a while, they start to get loose, and you'd have to unwrap this whole thing and, and rewrap it. So they went with that for about 2,000 years, and then they invented this three-quarter groove axe. This has this flat spot back here with this piece of wood and a shim in it. Shim is a piece of wood that's thinner on one end than the other. When it would get loose, you could put your fingernail in there, tighten that shim up, use it for another 15 or 20 minutes, and it would loosen again, and then you tighten it back up again. Doctor's gonna be pretty close. You might wanna get a little farther up. The same way over here, no, I'm a little more that way or this way, yeah. It's gonna fly. It's gonna fly more this way because the uh, log is slanted that way. So uh, these were much better to work with uh, because you had a way of tightening back up. If they get loose, what they'll do is they'll come into a notch like this, and then they'll hit, and then they'll fly over like that, and they'll nap off the bit. That's one of the breakage patterns. If you saw my uh, program last night, we talked about the side slap breakage. The other way they break is if they're a celt. These become a celt later on at about uh, 1000 BC. And then this is when it's wedged into the handle. It's a much better uh, system. It doesn't get loose unless you want it to. If you want to take it out, let's say you're in a canoe, uh, this handle's gonna be in the way. All you do is hit it over the log. Well, this is a soft wood here. And it'll come loose easily, yeah. Yeah, we'll try it on the knot. So when these come out, you can use them as a chisel or a wedge. Most tools have more than one use. This is a good example. It's kind of like using your uh, uh, screwdriver for a chisel. But then, even though it's made as one tool, it also is another one. What I learned is that if I put the handle or the uh, stone back in the handle the wrong way, I'll split my handle because I split seven handles my first year. And we have around Cahokia Mounds near St. Louis, when we have axes that are symmetrical, and it's hard to tell what the front or back is, we have a tally mark right here. I got my fingernail in it. And that tells you, we've always wondered what it was, 150 years in the archaeological journals trying to figure out what they are. After I broke those seven handles, I realized that's a little tally mark to tell you what the front of your axe is. It's that simple. So then all you have to do is hit it, and it's seated. Well, it's not seated yet. I hit it wrong. Get my tally mark. There we go. What you do with this is you chop about three or four chops in one spot. Then you move over about two inches. See what I mean? Be careful over there, because it will fly. You really have to hold this fairly vertical, because it will want to side slap. That's why I make my handles oval, so that they won't turn very well in your hand. Now this is a fairly soft wood and it doesn't cut as well as the harder woods we get. Uh, lo black locust is my favorite because it cleans, cuts very clean and all the pieces fly right out of there. Now if we can get some of these to come out a little farther. I'd like to see if you could pick one up. Take a look at it and you're gonna see that the last quarter of an inch is crushed. <laughs> that also gives me a break. <laughs> what happens is it cuts and then it wedges. And that's why these things work so efficiently, even though they look very dull, because they wedge the stuff out. <laughs> At Angel Mounds several years ago, I did a demo and a cameraman came up and set up his camera with a tripod, a TV camera. And I said, buddy, you might want to watch out because this stuff really comes out here, set up over here or back here. And he said, his exact words were, never mind, I'm a professional. <laughs> <laughs> so what these, 
about this big came off, hit the center of the lens and knocked the camera and he caught the camera before it fell over. That's what the power that this thing hits with sometimes. I, w I never got the video. I wish I heck I had got the video. <laughs> uh, this ax has cut 400 trees from a half inch in diameter, 12 inches. Wow. Never been resharpened. This ax has cut 300 trees, half inch in diameter, 12 inches, never been resharpened. But old granddad here has cut 3,500 trees, half inch in diameter, 12 inches. This made the wood hinge at Cahokia Mounds. It made the stockade around the Callahan Pit House at Cahokia Mounds and a lot of other projects. I built a house on my property. It was in the SPT bulletin uh, a couple of like, issues ago. So these things last a long time. When we find axes, these three-quarter grooved axes at the bullseye site in Illinois, buried with uh, ancient people, we find them used until there's hardly anything left. I've cut those 3,500 trees. I haven't lost a sixteenth of an inch. So if you think about how long that axe must have been used, and how prized it must have been by that, either that person or their relatives to bury with him, it really gives another interpretation to archeology. span We can start shedding light, and that's what this is all about. We're, we're shedding light on archeology span with this. And so if we can interpret what happens here and interpret that to archeology span as, as, wow, these things must have lasted forever. This guy must have been some big guy or, or you know, whatever it does. It helps in that, in that quest. Uh, now I have Big Mama here, and Big Mama I'm not going to use because I got the old handle that I broke here several years ago. And I've had some illness since then, and so I didn't, I haven't put the new handle on. The handle broke, and eight, uh, eight inches broke off the old handle, and I found out that I had more control with it. What I did is about, I think, Rabbit Stick 2007, I went to Angel Mounds, in Indiana, and I cut two notches in a log, about oh, eight or ten inches apart. And those, I did that with the black axe. That took a half hour to knock that notch out. All right. Then I took one swing with Big Ma. If so I got the picture right, and we knocked out the chunk in between. This axe was found. Well, this is a replica of one that was found in a cache of 70 axes that were found just about 20 miles east of uh, Fairbury Heights, uh, where the uh, Grossman site is, that's east of Cahokia Mounds. So when they said they were ceremonial, that's where the challenge, the gauntlet was thrown down. Because we all know what happens when we don't know what something's used for. <laughs> we call ceremonial. it ceremonial. <laughs> so I decided that I would replicate it. I tried to replicate this with a 36 pound piece of basalt and I worked with a flint hammer stone for 11 and a half hours and six inches broke off the end. Yeah, and it ruined my experiment. But I did have a 63 pound chunk and I made this one with all modern tools. But in order to see if it worked right, I pecked from here down six and a half hours to make the edge authentic. The rest you can see the grind marks on, but I'm really not worried about that. So you notice in that picture, when I hafted it, I had the handle way up here. And after a while, I realized I had no control. I could break, break the handles very easily. Then I realized that, okay, most of the other axes are wider at the bit instead of the middle. And I said, okay, that's what means that this has to come down to the middle and it gives me much more control. Then I realized that the bit is narrower. Most axes, the bit is wider. And what they're doing is they're concentrating their blow. So I thought about this, okay, uh, when Marquette came down the Illinois River in 1673, he said he saw 70 men in a canoe with a fire going in the center of the canoe. Just think of that, 70 people. If you had 35 people abreast, that canoe's gonna have to be five, at minimum of six feet wide. And you're gonna need three feet at least for each man to row. So you're talking about a 140 foot long canoe. When Father Members came down in 1675, <coughs> he said he saw, he passed in a Linawek village, and in that village there were several hundred canoes, many of which were 50 to 70 feet long. So our concept of what these people were doing at that time 
is very shallow. We're thinking about little uh, canoes that we use today. They are making very large canoes that carry large amounts of weight. They're bringing Mill Creek Flint from Southern Illinois, probably by the tons, to Cahokia Mounds up the Mississippi River. They're bringing uh, copper from the Great Lakes down the Mississippi River. And we're, we're talking about some people that really got around. And so I started chopping big logs with this thing, and it wouldn't work. I could swing that other small axe so much better. And that's what, and then I thought about Abraham Lincoln. When Ab you know, I'm from Illinois, let the land of Lincoln. And so Abraham Lincoln would stand on those logs, and he'd chop a notch with that broad axe, and then he'd chop another notch, and then he'd chop another notch, and then he'd take that big heavy broad axe and knock the chunk out in between. That's what made me realize what this was for. So even though it may be a ceremonial cache, I can't rule that out. But I can rule out that it's not functional. It's axe mark. It's a, a, we, <laughs> I did one program on sometimes an axe is just an axe. Well, that's what this one is. And I, I can show you that it can be used. I just right now, I don't have the handle to do that. But I can swing it over my head. You sure can't cut a tree down with it. You know, if you go sideways, I can't even get my it's arm down perfect. sideways, oh. and I know, but I, with what I call a one-way axe, all you have to do is lift it up. It does all the work by itself after that. Also, in order to take a large chunk like that, you need something this massive. If you try to use those axes, they're not nearly heavy enough to take out a big chunk like that. So, with the experiments that we've been doing, just uh, some people call it playing around. I don't know if I'd call it that. I think we've been doing pretty pretty well with what we do. So um, if anybody wants to try one of these, especially I'd I'm, I'm rather have you use the black axe because the other ones, uh, especially the 3,500 one, I don't want to break that one. And that's a 24 year experiment. I'd rather, if I'm going to break it, I'd rather break that one myself. One of the other axes that we had break broke off. Well, a nine year old boy broke one of my axes with the side slap. Came in like that in a, and broke the axe off. That is one of the most common breakage patterns with axes. About three quarters of them are that way. But there's another one where they break off clean, just straight across. And that's from overpowering. It's like putting a handle like that on an axe like this. When you swing it, I was actually swinging with my feet coming off the ground on a piece of black locust. And when it broke, it sounded like a rifle going off. And so that, those are the two breakage patterns that I've seen, and we see this archaeologically all over Illinois, all over the Midwest at least. So we're also, in fact, I've been asked to do, co-author some papers on axe breakage, and then we're going to be working on that pretty soon. So uh, if anybody wants to try it, all I ask is that when you chop, please get on one knee, be fairly uh, vertical, please do not come from the side. You only want no, you want no more than a five degree angle. And you see when I hit there how it slips over? You want to be pretty, hold it pretty solid, and swing on it.